better bands than Soundgarden. I'll start all of them. Any band, every band. Godsmack. Godsmack is for sure better. At the end of the day, who would, what would you rather sing a song about Black Hole Sons, The Spoon Man? No, I'd rather sing songs by Godsmack. Why would he say that about his black son? I don't know. What rhymes with son? Come. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Won't you come? I have a theory about that song, and I'll share it later in the episode. So stick around. You can start with that if you want. Okay, in my opinion, <clears throat> let's start off. Let's jump off the deep end here. Black Hole Sun, one of uh, Soundgarden's biggest songs. Is it the biggest song? Oh, I, th- I would think it's like a deep cut. Only Black the, Hole Sun? Only the true fans know about that one. True. Black Hole Sun's video is up there with, uh, what's the uh, vi- the the uh, Genesis video that everyone knows about? Uh, the Mexican one, the racist one? No, like the one with the dolls. You know what I mean? Like if you grew up in the 90s, I guess you would have watched TV and you would have seen the video. I don't think I know what you're talking about. Oh, you don't know anything about music? <laughs> Duh. Anyways, uh, Black Hole Sun stuck out in your head for sure. Epically terrible music video. Just yeah. truly one of the worst videos ever made. Yeah, but everyone for some reason was just so like blown away by it. I guess if you're... Competition is Smells Like Teen Spirit, which is the dudes in the band in a gymnasium with people standing around. It's a pretty low bar. I could tell you why people like that music video in the 90s. is because in the 90s, everyone was on nitrous oxide and all TV looked like that to them anyways. They were like, oh shit, am I tripping or just, just another day? Okay, Black Hole Sun is a song about assholes. Obviously. Yeah, that's Wait, what it's so about. so you thought this was going to like blow everyone's mind? Boiling Heat, Summer Stench. Neath the black, the sky looks dead. Call my name through the cream. Yeah, that's through the, the cream. And I'll hear you scream again. It's a b-hole that got Jade in. Yeah, this song is about fucking ass fucking. For sure, 100%. And I'll hear you scream again. This song is about ass play. Black Hole Sun, won't you come and wash away the rain? Black Hole Sun, won't you come, 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 won't you come. And I quote, those are the lyrics. And then that's the part of the song where they start panning the background vocals. Like they really want a lot of special attention paid to that line. I normally make fun of lyrics by bands because it's easy to do. Almost every band is fucking terrible at writing lyrics in rock music. And I was going to pull some examples of Soundgarden songs, but it's all of them. Every Soundgarden song has some of the worst lyrics. But this one is one where, because this is definitely their biggest song. Obviously, when they got asked about a lot, people were always asking him, what does it mean? Yeah. This is one where Cornell, he would talk about what the songs were about when they had a meaning. And this is one where he was like, literally just made some bullshit up. I don't know. It doesn't mean anything. (laughs) Real quick side note, the amount of conversations that I've had to have with people explaining the fact that when we said that uh, Nirvana was just singing gibberish, we didn't make it up. Yeah. Kurt Cobain him fucking self said that he literally made up bullshit words. So stop shitting on us or getting mad at us for speaking the truth. The exact quote from this song, oh my gosh. I may have just, I didn't delete it. Okay. Uh, on Black Hole Sun, Cornell added, quote, lyrically, it's probably the closest to me just playing with words for words sake of anything I've ever written. I guess it worked for a lot of people who heard it, but I have no idea how you'd begin to take that one literally. (laughs) So fuck us, right? Because this is what's going to happen. Someone's going to go, no, they wrote songs that were really serious. No, dude, you just, you're just dumb. You were serious. Yes, you're serious. They they weren't serious. And you're thinking this song is about like the end of the world and the sun's going to blow up and engulf me and life is depressing. And it's really about assholes. When it was time to make the music video, when the band talks about that, they said that they never really liked making music videos. And on that one, all they could think was, well, I guess we'll have to see what this dude comes up with for this song. (laughs) So then the guy who made the video was the one who came up with the idea of a black hole sun sucking people up into it and shit. But like the band wasn't thinking that at all when they wrote this song. It's just nonsense fucking words. (laughs) I think I read something that said something along the lines of they were shocked that anybody liked the video. And yet I do vividly remember, now this was pre everyone having a cell phone and Facebook and sharing their thoughts. Everyone that I knew was completely baffled. 
if you watch Headbangers Ball or whatever that would have been played on MTV, they were just talking about how like it was groundbreaking and blah, 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 blah. And they went on to win a Grammy for it. They won like best music video. Well, no one had seen that effect that they put on all the faces, that distortion. Yeah, they did. They do. Like, all you have to do is eat a few handful of mushrooms and you'll have the same exact experience, I promise. How has nobody ever sat Neil deGrasse Tyson down, put a camera on him and just made him listen to this song? I bet his head would explode. Yeah, sure. Because he would have been like, what the fuck are they talking about? <laughs> the black hole sun is not, is not how it would work. I kind of want that to happen. So Soundgarden in general, not just that song, uh, this is serious dirtbag music. Dirt <laughs> Only a true dirtbag could sit around listening to multiple Soundgarden songs in a row. Everything about it is just skeezy as fuck. The guitar riffs are all way dumber than any new metal band you've ever heard of and not in a good way. New metal guitar riffs are dumb, but fun. These are dumb and not fun. Aggressively not fun. They're not fun. I wonder legitimately if they were bummed out because Dead and Bloated is a heavier riff than anything they ever wrote. True. I mean, it would suck if you're in a, a hard rock band and Stone Temple Pilots of all bands writes a harder, heavier song than you ever wrote. That would be fucking depressing. I'm not going to lie. I'd be pretty, pretty bummed about that. The band that wrote Sour Girl went harder than you. <laughs> oh, God. Brutal. Hey, um, Puddle of Mud, legitimately a better band than Soundgarden. Sure. There were a ton of great bands that were never got nearly as big. It's like the, the curse of time. Soundgarden came out earlier in Nirvana and Pearl Jam time. And uh, time and place. If Soundgarden was not from Seattle, you would never have heard of this band. And that's a fact. Well, yeah, I think we, I feel like we have a, uh, why SD card error on that one. Okay. Well, let me see if I can turn it back on. While Mark is dealing with the camera. So Soundgarden origin story is two of these dudes were from Chicago, went out to this Seattle area, Washington. One of them knows one of the guys who started Sub Pop Records. So as you can imagine, they had a fairly easy time getting a record deal. I would ask all of you to imagine an alternate timeline where they never move away from Chicago and Soundgarden is from Chicago. Nobody would Do care. you think God, that you no, would have heard no. of this band? We wouldn't even have this conversation. This episode doesn't exist. Smashing Pumpkins from Chicago happens to break through because Billy Corgan is one of the best guitar players of all time. Siamese Dream is one of the best rock albums ever made. Being from Chicago did not hold them back. Okay, so that one's fucked. Unless you got an SD card. I, what is you that? A micro SD card? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Tyler, not a big technology guy here. They got one of these. I think I have something that looks like that in my phone. No, that's cool. No. That is a SIM card. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what happened. That sucks. Well, we have three cameras. The Soundgarden song Rusty Cage sounds exactly like what you'd expect to hear from every idiot making fun of 90s radio rock. That song sounds like the band's Soundgarden fans are making fun of. Like, you know, they try to make fun of Stone Temple Pilots or Creed. They do that voice, the 90s radio guy voice. Stone Temple Pilots and Creed are great bands. Soundgarden is fucking terrible and their singer actually sounds like what you're doing when you're trying to make fun of the actually good 90s rock bands. Well, they like sucked the fun out of rock and roll. I think that's the thing that when I went back and re-listened to this and I realized when I was listening to it that I have not listened to it since I was a teenager, realistically, because this has no replay value to me whatsoever. I've definitely listened to Pearl Jam as an adult. I definitely have not listened to Soundgarden as an adult, partially because I enjoy fun music and having a good time in my life. And never in my life have I, well, never in my adult life have I said to myself, I'm having a great day. What would make this day better? Soundgarden. Never. Nobody ever says that. Nobody ever says throw on the Soundgarden. Unless it's, this is like the guy showing up to a, party with a fucking guitar nobody wants you there go home put the guitar away Soundgarden comes on everyone's like turn it off if you put on like the Soundgarden Spotify playlist at a party everyone might get soaked about the first song but by three four songs in 
it's you and two other dudes hanging out. Everyone's gone. Everyone left the party. Conversely, you throw Creed Spotify playlists on at a party and everyone's probably going to have a great time. Everyone's going to have a great time and they're going to pretend like they're not. That's the difference. Act like oh. you're doing it ironically. Yeah, exactly. But in reality, they know every word and they're like, God, this shit's actually awesome. And they're still coming to terms with that as an adult, how great Creed was. Like when you and your buddy have to pretend you're making fun of it when you jack each other off. Oh yeah, what are you gonna do? Like drink each other off, bro? Like uh, like take your pants off. And, like, you, won't grab you. you won't do it. You won't do it, man. Yeah. But yeah. then you do it and you have like a fucking great time. <laughs> I'm just curious, how is it possible to say Creed sucks when you listen to a band that literally has a song called Jesus Christ Pose and has some of the most dumbass guitar playing of all time on yeah. it? And not kidding. The song is called Jesus Christ Pose, and it's like about people doing Jesus Christ poses. Mm -hmm. I think Soundgarden has got to be up there, top of the heap, 90s rock bands, maybe second only to Nirvana as far as people applying what they think the songs mean. Most Soundgarden lyrics make no sense at all. Look at all the random shit that Chris Cornell wrote in the song Get on the Snake and try to figure out what he even thought that song was about as soon as you start to think you've got a grasp on it like okay this snake must be a metaphor for cars sitting in traffic on the interstate or something he then starts talking about how the snake is located at a place where the water turns to steam and his heart is bleeding but he also starts talking about the snake being a metal river that also bleeds so now everything's bleeding and he's sad and it's just like what the fuck is going on right now man are you okay are you okay <laughs> Are you all right? Blink if you're not. It's got deep meaning, bro. You just don't get it. One of the funniest things about Jesus Christ Pose is that song exists because Perry Farrell is so annoying. Oh, God. When are we <laughs> going to do an episode on that? That should be like a three-hour episode. Not, I, not that I even know a single person that likes I do Jane's not, Addiction. I do not want to listen to Jane's Addiction for that episode. <laughs> no. um, Fair. Oh, there's a very real chance that the person I'm talking about could hear about this, and it would probably bum them out, but... Honestly, it was so awful that I don't care. Um, I was hanging out in my usual spot the other night and a dude who DJs around town stopped in for an impromptu DJ session, as in it was not advertised and nobody was in this bar to hear this dude DJ. But I was just, there. Yeah, you were there now that I'm thinking about it. Um, he had obviously just gone like record shopping that day or something and bought only live albums everything he played was off a live album and one selection i would say was egregiously bad far worse than the others was playing i forgot that mark was there for this so it took us dude we talked probably too loud but i kind of also wanted them to hear us bitching so loudly about how bad it was the, it took us about two minutes it, into it this so song bad. to realize what it even was yes and, and I, you figured out before i did and i still took another minute after you to figure out what you were talking about it was jane's addiction trying to cover sympathy for the devil mm -hmm. by the rolling stones and however bad you think that that would be i promise it's a lot worse so yeah if that hadn't recently happened i would probably be more stoked on the idea of doing a jane's addiction episode but as it stands right now i hope that i never have to hear another second of that band's music no, there's a reason why i haven't listened to fucking soundgarden or jane's addiction or so many other bands from 1998 or 1995 or whatever because I, I grew out of it and don't want to listen to it anymore. Uh, in preparation for this, had to endure Chris Cornell's cover of that Prince song, Nothing Compares to You, which made me want to smash my face on my computer keyboard over and over again. Yeah, we'll probably have to cover Chris Cornell's solo stuff uh, later on in the episode. I was thinking about that earlier. That Oof. cover is atrocious. I mean, it's up there with... Uh, What's that uh, Bridge Over Troubled Water cover by uh, Disturbed? Or oh, oh, Sound, Sound of Silence. Silence. <laughs> I wish it was Bridge Over Troubled Water. <laughs> it could, it, that would be hilarious. Anyways, the, the cover is atrocious. Just because somebody can sing high and be what I would consider to be the dollar store version of Robert Plant 
doesn't make them a great singer. And that cover is a great example of why. So I don't intend on going through every Soundgarden album one at a time or anything like that, because obviously almost nobody has ever done that. I did want to point out that if you are um, involved in music production in any way or a musician in any way or just interested in identifying what good music production versus bad sounds like, the Soundgarden album Ultra Mega OK hands down one of the worst guitar sounds you'll ever hear the production on the whole album is really fucking bad uh i think that the story goes is that they wanted to sign to sst to you know to be cool because uh grunge basically only happened because buzz from the melvins liked side b of my war yes <laughs> uh so and then the the producer was not a seattle guy and was just like trying to mix Soundgarden like they were uh, the Wipers or some shit like that. And then uh, Ultra Mega OK is also the first example of Soundgarden's relentless dedication to coming up with the worst album titles of all time. What does anyone think that Bad Motor Finger even means? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Who was the person in this band that thought it was a clever idea to mash a bunch of words together like they were one word? All the album titles are uh, multiple words, yeah. super unknown. Yeah. We should title this episode Soundgarden Sucks with yeah, no, no, spaces. no spaces in it. <laughs> I, we're definitely doing that. Um, yeah. Also, I had no idea they even put out an album in whatever, 2010 or whatever it was. It's not good. Man. No, it, I mean, even hardcore Soundgarden fans were like, this is so bad. Yeah. The, uh, it wasn't that late. It wasn't 2010. Well, because the, the drummer spent, what, a decade... Uh, being the drummer for Pearl Jam and Dude, basically we, forgot how to play his drum uh, kit. <laughs> when your band sucks so bad, your drummer's like, well, I have this offer to keep playing with Pearl Jam because he had been playing with Pearl Jam for a long time. I think I'm just going to stay playing with Pearl Jam. You know your, your band really sucks. Yeah. Take it from him, not even from us. You don't even have to listen to the rest of this podcast. The drummer of the band decided to stay in the other 90s alternative rock band instead of rejoining the original band that he was in these guys all take showers and we each have our own bus so we all have fun right yeah <laughs> uh i mean i don't feel like i'm gonna fall asleep playing these songs every night because it's boring as shit Soundgarden live is incredibly boring and dull actually that's a pretty good segue into what i want to talk about we should just talk about the album super unknown by Soundgarden because this is very much a rumors by fleetwood mac situation there are millions of people walking around who claim to love a band, but they've only ever heard one album and have never made an attempt to listen to any of the other albums. But they love the band so much. Half the people who are going to get mad at this have only ever tried to listen to one Soundgarden album. Pearl Jam's not like that. Pearl Jam fans are freaks, dude. Pearl Jam fans extremely give a fuck about like everything that band has ever done. Yeah. Not so with Soundgarden. No, no, no. Hence why the drummer decided to stay with Pearl Jam. He's like, man, we play like a different set every night and play a bunch of fun songs. And everyone and, likes it. <laughs> and, and everyone's having a great time. What's really crazy is people record the show and then they, they literally still pass the live shows around to all their buddies. It's so cool, dude. Anyways, what do you guys want to play Black Hole Sun again? No, no, I think I'm done. There's something to be said for a band that can mix up their set list from night to night and the fans aren't mad about it. No, they're, they're like stoked. There are definitely Pearl Jam fans who have seen them like 10 times hoping that they'll play their favorite song because they haven't even heard that favorite song. I did not look up any Soundgarden set list for this show, but I would be pretty surprised if the set list wasn't just nearly every song from Super Unknown than with whatever other bullshit they wanted to throw in there. Jesus Christ pose and whatever else. And if they didn't play most of the songs from Super Unknown, I guarantee fucking tee you they would get one star reviews from their fans about it. That's all that the people buying the tickets know. Yeah, it's a very shallow, and I know that people don't want to acknowledge this because I read a lot of freaking comments about this. It's a really shallow catalog. You really know four or five songs, and that's about it. And honestly, did you really want to go see them play Spoon Man again? I mean, really, there, wasn't, uh, there weren't deep cuts 
Pearl Jam fans are like, man, I hope they play release tonight. I hope they play deep tonight or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And a whole dude, dude, bunch of songs. Do you listen to Pearl Jam, bro? No, nah, bro. I've never even listened. I, I hate that. There's their shit, whatever. Not cool. I'm not into it at all. Because I'd never uh, heard of those songs before that oh, you just said. Yeah, no, they, they're on a, they're on an album or something. I don't even know. Uh, I just don't think that the, like past the, the hit songs, anybody was like, I can't wait for Soundgarden to play number nine on the third album. What I want to know is where does this kind of person even come from? And you know the kind of person I'm talking about. I feel like this kind of person still exists, but it's hard to spot them. People don't buy albums, but there used to be a person who would buy one or two albums a year at Walmart. It's the same one or two albums that every other person who only buys one or two albums mm -hmm. a year bought that mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. Like all the people who bought that Bloodhound Gang album with the Nothing But Mammals song yeah. on it. Those people, uh, the people who bought Jagged Little Pill, but then nothing else that Alanis Morissette ever did or, or Purple Rain, you know. Mm -hmm. These types of music fan are why you can go to the Wikipedia page for most of the famous artists that you have heard of who've put out at least five albums and maybe all those albums sell pretty well, but there'll be one in there that sold tens of millions of more copies than everything else that they ever did. How often do you think it's been the case that an artist just popped off one time in their life and came out with some shit that would actually 10, 20, 50 times better than anything else that they had done before or since then. Yeah. That's got to be a pretty fucking rare thing. If Soundgarden came out today, they wouldn't exist. Becoming popular now in this day and age is way harder than it was in the 90s because at the time, people still bought albums. Like if you put out one hit song, everyone bought your album. Some people bought singles, but like if you had a big enough song, no, that movie would suck, bro. <laughs> You could sell 10 million albums really realistically with one, maybe two songs off of one album that were popular. It is way harder now to sell one tenth of those, that numbers. And I think my point is, if Soundgarden came out in 2023, I just don't think anybody would care. I think they would just be a boring band of just like, eh, okay. The bar now is way higher and way harder you kind of can prove what you're saying because, yeah, Soundgarden's not around and they're not releasing new albums right now. But the thing about recording music is you put it out there and it's always in the world. People keep discovering it if it's good and worth discovering. Mm -hmm. And that's not happening. No. Teenagers today are not finding out about Soundgarden. And I don't give a fuck if you have a shitty fucking kid who just found out about Soundgarden and you're the one person who wants to not true. leave a comment and say that, yeah, well, my kid loves Soundgarden. Your kid probably just doesn't want to hurt your feelings, bro. Okay. Yeah. You're probably really fucking annoying if you're about to leave that comment on our YouTube channel. So I would venture to guess that your kid probably just doesn't want to hurt your feelings. But what you do see is kids running around in Nirvana shirts. Today, right now, leave your house, walk around for an hour, and you're going to see a Nirvana t-shirt, Yeah, not Soundgarden shirts. And yeah. I guarantee you the Soundgarden shirts are way cheaper. That's where we're at. And in case you're confused about why you like Soundgarden and you think Soundgarden is a great band, but kids today don't, is because... You were a kid today when Soundgarden came out, and it is a scientifically proven fact that nearly all people spend the rest of their lives listening to the music that was popular when they figured out how to give themselves an orgasm, which is not such a fucking crazy notion if you think about it in terms like that. You found out about Soundgarden when you learned how to jack off mm -hmm. and give your brain good feelings, so now you have good feelings in your brain when you listen to Soundgarden. This is not hard. It's science, but it's not rocket science. The power of nostalgia is just, it's wild how strong it is. The thing that's really interesting to me is how few people outside of us, and I think this is part of our job at this podcast, is to remind you just because you liked something when you were 13, 14, 15, whatever, doesn't mean that it's good. You were a fucking kid with terrible music taste and you're an adult now and it's time to acknowledge the fact that bands you listened to when you were young sucked shit. It's okay. You, you can still like it too. Yeah. You just, it, please admit to yourself that it's bad. It's not good. You can. St we're not saying you can't listen to shitty music. You should listen to shitty music. You can listen to whatever you want to listen to. You don't owe anyone an explanation why you listen to it. But you got to be honest with yourself. 
they suck. They don't hold up. The songs don't hold up. And it, it was a time and a place in your brain. You were nutting. I get it. You know, in between songs on MTV, you were flipping to like the Cinemax channel and it was all fuzzy. And you're like, I think I saw a nipple. You know, I get that. This also sounds like you're talking about something that you've done before. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm talking about my personal experience here. I'm okay with that. <laughs> The other thing about this, and I'm sure that we've talked about this in previous grunge episodes, it would blow my mind if it doesn't come up in every episode we ever do on a grunge band. The thing about adults who are still nostalgic for this is this is like the worst parts about being a teenager. That's what you're nostalgic for. Like this is bummer time music and you miss that. And that's really sad in a way that... I don't know how to make funny. Like, I don't have a joke right now. Who feels good when they press play on a Soundgarden album? Unless you're a drummer. I get that. And we'll talk about that in a minute because the whole time signature thing, we'll get there. But like, if you're not actually a drummer, a person who plays drums, I don't know what's going on here. I know so many people over the age of, I don't know, say like 35-ish. My Chemical Romance is so dumb, whatever, fill in the blank. Emo music is stupid, and yet they like Soundgarden. They love Soundgarden. They love so many of these 90s rock bands. Yeah, this song suck, man. There's not even a guy screaming every word at you in the same pitch, no matter regardless of what the key the song's in. Like, what? Black Ocean! Exactly. Black Ocean! Black Ocean! What if I just did that for the rest like, of the episode? who? Yeah. <laughs> Be a, entertaining. There's no one... That goes to the bar and goes, man, put on fucking Spoon Man, dude. You put on My Chemical Romance at a bar, people are probably going to have a great time. Half the bar is going to go fucking nuts, Absolutely. man. You throw Helena on in yes. a bar with an internet jukebox yes. and there will be active cheers. If you go to a bar with internet jukebox and throw Spoon Man on, mm -hmm. probably going to get a boo. One or two boo. And the guy sitting in the corner with long hair that never grew out of it is just going to be banging his head. Everyone else is going to be looking around like, yeah, I remember this band? Cool. That was cool. Spoon Man is definitely more evidence for the theory that most people have terrible taste in music, and you can tell how bad a song is by how popular it gets. And that's why a band's dumbest song so often becomes one of their biggest hits. Black Hole Sun and Spoon Man are both very dumb songs, and that's this band's biggest hits. Can you imagine being in this band and having to spend actual years of your life getting on a stage to perform Spoon Man again? Yeah, I know. That, that song sounds like a joke. It sounds like a joke song that you would come up with to make your friends laugh. Guys, I wrote a new song. What is it? Well, check it out. And then everyone's pissing their pants laughing and you all know for a fact that you're never going to record it because it was a joke. I think my favorite thing with Spoon Man was looking it up and Watching people argue about what it was about. It's pretty clear what it's about. That's the only Soundgarden song where it's pretty fucking obvious what that song's about. There's a guy who played Spoons, and that's who the song's about. He, I know. They had that's, him in the studio to play on the song. I was going to say, that's actually what it's about. Cornell actually did explain this one, and he said that it's about how music, not just Spoons and the rhythm, can heal you, blah, 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 blah. There's a line in Spoon Man where he goes, all my friends are Indians, all my friends are brown and red. Oh, are they okay? Are they Chris Cornell? <laughs> <laughs> and then here's the other thing about all of this. Soundgarden got famous on Spoon Man. Yes. That was their first Spoon real Man. hit. Yeah. They had released other songs that are now considered classics by the fans. And I'm sure with all like the uh, revisionist history that music fans love to do so much, they have convinced themselves that everyone flipped out for those songs when they dropped. But that is not the case. Not counting the kids who bought any album recently made by a band from Seattle after Nirvana began selling hundreds of thousands of albums every week. There were no radio stations outside Seattle that really gave a fuck about Soundgarden until they released Spoon Man as the first single from Super Unknown. Also, you sign a record deal. Mm -hmm. You make a whole album. You put this stupid fucking song on it and someone from your label picks that as the first I single. Know. Don't you Blows think that mind. that would be a pretty big warning sign? Oh yeah, the guys from the label loves it. That's when you delete the album, dude. Yeah. Delete the entire fucking album. Well, we're going to make Spoon Man the first thing. And they're like, what? 
fucking spoon man okay hope that fucking works and somehow it does the most depressing grunge band is alice in chains but nearly all grunge was very depressing soundgarden is not an exception soundgarden has a song on the basketball diaries soundtrack is how depressing soundgarden is it is baffling to me how many people convince themselves a that these song lyrics are deep but b that this music is not depressing it's just straight up depression man maybe that's part of it like at least nowadays this is emo so you know that it's emo music back then they wouldn't acknowledge the fact that it was emo well, they music, were trying to so, dress like bikers and right. sing all tough do you think that's as tough <laughs> yeah you're that's... screaming about being sad you're not tough this isn't badass it's like an entire generation of music fans living in denial of the fact that what they're listening to is depressing emo music Pearl Jam was probably always bigger, you know, all the way to the bitter end. Oh, that, because unquestionably, if nothing else, like people had a good fucking time at Pearl Jam concerts, even if they were singing about dumb shit, too. It was at least fun. You were at least going to have a good time with your buddies at the end of the show. You weren't going to go home and be like, OK, that happened. Yeah, I just can't imagine Chris Cornell ever being like, yo, if you got a beer, get him up for this next song. We're about to party, right? Right. Yeah. And then you play what? What song does he play? Spoon Man? Right. That's the only uh, one that even comes close to like, let's have some fun. What is this song that's stuck in my head that... Dun, 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 I'm gonna do the show now. Is that Shine Down? Yeah. Outshine. 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 Yeah. Shine Down. Better band than Soundgarden. Do way better. Dude, I, I kind of want to listen to Shine Down now. Chris Cornell writes a song called Ugly Truth and sad teenagers across America are all like, yeah, man, the truth is ugly. <laughs> That's so real. I can relate to that. Then if you look at the lyrics of it, instead of imagining that Chris Cornell is screaming about some shit that you can relate to, look at the lyrics and it's just a pretty creepy song about an ex-girlfriend that doesn't make a lot of sense. I wonder if he was just also just rhyme scheming and doing word gibberish. That one seems like he was actually uh, trying to actually write a song. Yeah, it it's weird. Like I said, creepy. It's just kind of like gross. Sure. It's very much in the vein of treating a woman like a possession. Okay. If I can't have you, maybe I didn't even want you. Maybe I'll just throw you away if I did have you. Or just Which like, is kind of like singles. I guess if you watch singles, it probably all kind of comes full circle. Do you want to talk about that? No, I don't. Okay. I know, I know. I haven't watched it too long. If I, I should have watched it. I guarantee you, if you go back and watch that movie, you're going to be like, this sucks. I definitely haven't watched <laughs> it in at least 15 years. So you're probably right. Doesn't hold up as well as what Encino Man. Encino Man holds up. Is That's the Brendan Fraser, yes. Pauly Shore one? Yes. We yeah. use the juice. Yeah, I would watch that before I would watch singles. Fantastic. For sure. Pretty much anything with Brendan Fraser in it. He's, he's such a treasure, I think. Yeah, I agreed. Earlier when I said I can see listening to Soundgarden if you're a drummer, yeah, I get it. Because this band did do a lot of songs that were not in a 4-4 time signature, which is a pretty rare thing for popular music. If you're in like a cover band and you're a drummer, you probably get sick of playing the same drum beat all night. But guess what? That's the drum beat everyone wants to hear. So shut the fuck up and be a good drummer. No one wants to listen to this shit. I can tell you that right now. No one fucking cares how much fun you're having counting in a different way than you count for the rest of the night. You picked drums, be a drummer. Count to four like a normal fucking drummer, okay? Yeah. I have definitely mentioned Helmet on this podcast before, but I will repeat, why are you not listening to the band Helmet? Paige Hamilton is a trained jazz guitarist who then started a metal band. So all you Soundgarden fans who are going to want to talk about time signatures in the comments and pretend Soundgarden is the only heavy non-prog metal band capable of playing songs not in 4-4, dial it back three or four notches. My recommendation for listening to music, if for some reason you're younger and never got to experience this entire world of music, you can skip over... You just listen to the Melvins. It's grunge music before grunge music existed. Like if the <laughs> Melvins didn't exist, this podcast probably wouldn't exist or certainly our ability to cover every band that happened after 1993 wouldn't have happened. Rock and roll as it became in the 90s with the grunge era. 
wouldn't have happened without Melvins. Honestly, probably new metal wouldn't have happened without the Melvins. Basically, all of rock music for 20 fucking years wouldn't have existed if the Melvins didn't happen. So you can just skip it all and listen to the Melvins. Definitely brought up Melvins we in, have before, in many the times. Nirvana episode was the yeah. first time, I think. And this is the second biggest, I would say, influenced band by the Melvins. Nirvana. Soundgarden? Right up no there. No way. Yes. In the same way as all of grunge, sure. But... I hear more like butthole surfers, especially in yes, earlier yes, Soundgarden. Yes, yes. Definitely a ton of butthole surfers um, for sure. And then they tried and Ted Nugent. They tried to deny all of the <laughs> Zeppelin and Sabbath worship, but it's just undeniable, Dude. man. <laughs> like Dude. especially the album that they put out. I can't remember what it was called. Whatever album they put out right after Super Unknown. If you listen to that, it's just like someone remixed all of Jimmy Page's guitar licks and even the production, layering electric parts with acoustic guitar parts and Whatever. So yeah, like Sabbath, Zeppelin, Butthole Surfers, and then some Melvins mixed in. But what I was going to say though, the first time we brought Melvins up on the Nirvana episode, a bunch of kids who don't know dick about music tried to respond by saying that Melvins suck. Okay, you definitely don't know what you're talking about because if you did, you would know that you need to specify which era of that band you right. are saying sucks. Right, right. You can't just say that band sucks because they sound like six different bands across the life of the band. Yeah. It's like a pyramid of bands that exist because of, it may not even directly because of the Melvins, but indirectly because of the Melvins. It influenced an entire generation of, of heavy metal and rock and roll. Curious too about Butthole Surfers in comparison to Soundgarden is, I mean, obviously Butthole Surfers were a much better band and I would press play on a Butthole Surfers album so much faster than a Soundgarden album. And the Butthole Surfers were legitimately trying to make bad albums for most of their career, I would mm -hmm. say. Legitimately mm -hmm. trying, antagonistically trying to make bad albums. And it turns out that is better to listen to than Soundgarden. Yeah, imagine that. But the other thing about this time signature bullshit with Soundgarden, everyone acts like that makes them more sophisticated band or whatever. They didn't even do it on purpose. Kim is on record all over the place of saying like, yeah, everyone always asks us about the time signature thing. We don't do it on purpose. We only realize that it's in a weird time signature after we've written the song and we actually like have to count it out and everything. Musicians and drummers like to listen to music that is not in 4-4 time because again, when you're especially really good at playing an instrument. It's a lot of counting and it's a lot of counting to three or counting to four. Doing that over and over again in a set number of repetitions. And it gets old, man. I like to play pinball. One thing I say about pinball is it's one of the few things in life that the better you get at it, the more fun it is. The better you get at it, the more enjoyable it is. Yeah. Learning an instrument is not that way, especially when you hit like your first plateau where you get really good and you start learning all the music that you think is really good. And then one day you're like, oh, wait, it's a trick. It's a fucking trick. Yeah. Everyone does the same things because that's what works. If you want your music to be popular, it's just a trick. That's why musicians in particular then start looking around for stuff that is not using the trick, not doing the same tricks. But it doesn't mean it's good. It's just different. I can't stand when people cherry pick a reason like that. I mean, again, I listen to what I like and I don't care. But like when people nerd out about shit and then they end up being wrong about it, but they don't like want to acknowledge the fact that they were wrong about it. I mean, that kind of nukes the whole music nerd I know what I'm talking about thing like out of the water. I do think that we should probably talk about Chris Cornell's solo career because we're definitely not ever going to come back and do a Chris Cornell episode and maybe audio slave a bit because we're not doing that. Audio, ever, right? yeah, are we having to do audio I slave? don't think I so. I hope not. They, it's not enough. No, stuff. there's not enough there. And it's, although they probably had a couple songs that were probably better than anything Soundgarden ever put out. Well, it was Rage Against the Machine plus a yes. bad singer. Exactly, <laughs> yes screaming exactly the same way um speaking of how chris cornell just screamed the same way on basically every song a lot of folks don't seem to remember this i didn't read about it in many of the uh tributes or anniversary of articles but uh chris cornell made one of the worst albums of all time called scream and if you don't remember 
this, I assume you as a Soundgarden fan probably blocked it from your memory because it was a traumatic experience for you. <laughs> to block that one out. Scream is the one where Chris Cornell collaborated with the producer Timbaland. Y'all know who Timbaland is, right? Let's bring this back gently and slowly. Timbaland has done a lot of great work in the field of hip hop and neo soul and modern R&B. Genres that you might hear when you're out at a nightclub for the evening. Hit songs that everyone knows, undeniable classics. The problem with the Chris Cornell album Scream is that Chris Cornell had no business working with the guy who was producing Justin Timberlake's solo albums. Justin Timberlake literally does a guest spot on that Chris Cornell album. I didn't even know that this existed. It's not like the tracks are bad. It's just the issue with this album. It's like you're listening to two things happening at the same time that are not supposed to be happening at the same time. It's a Timbaland album musically, but then Chris Cornell does not even attempt to adapt his approach to being a vocalist to the genre of music that he's yeah. doing. When I say that this guy could only do one thing, you've got to listen to this album because he is trying to do the Soundgarden grunge screaming thing over dance club tracks. Can't, I can't even fathom. It's hurting my brain to think about. It is radically bizarre. It is mm. such a confusing experience. I can't imagine how many people had to be in the room at various points of this process and no one was like, guys, this is not it. This is yeah. not working the way that you think it's working. So he's screaming, but he did write lyrics about like going to the club. A lot of the songs are about bitches. Apparently Chris Cornell was like, oh, okay, I get it. So like, dance, I'll, so I'll just, I'll sing about bitches. I can't do it. <laughs> I can't even fathom it. It's like hurting my brain just it's, thinking I, about. Yeah, I mean, it's, oh, God. it sounds like a Saturday Night Live sketch. sketch. Yeah. For real. But it's not. And no one was kidding. Unless Timbaland the whole time was like, <clears throat> right. Yeah, d do that one. Like, can you fucking believe this guy? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> probably got paid a shit ton of money, I guess. Without ever have listened to this or heard this. There is. The curse of being such a big artist that nobody around you will say no. And that is a real deal curse that happens to many, many musicians in their life. You get to a certain point where you're so big and so famous and so liked that you come up with an idea and no one around you has the balls to just look at you in the eyes and say, this is a bad idea. Well, I also Don't do this. I think that Chris Cornell Seems like he was a legitimately nice person too, which is like pretty rare. I don't, I don't get a maybe lot. Maybe they didn't of, want to break his heart. Yeah, I don't get a lot of asshole vibes from him. So maybe he came in with this stuff, and he was just so handsome and sincere that everyone was just like, "Fuck." Yeah. The definition of the but he's a really nice guy thing. Yes, yes. We've talked about it before, but this is an example for anyone who was confused about us making jokes about nice guys. This is an example of what people mean. Yeah, but he's a really nice guy. They so want to break his heart. I hate his fucking band, but he's such a nice guy. Yeah. We got to put this album out, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, I guess. Well, I guess we got to do it. It's either put this album out or tell that pretty man to his face that he made a piece of dog shit. Timberland, how did it? I mean, this album sounds like shit. How did it go? Man, it was fucking great, man. Chris was so nice. Like, I had a great fucking time. It sounds like shit, but we got to put it out. The album bombed so hard. Definitely go look up some of the reviews that this thing got, because it's one of the ones where all of the music journalists got let out of the pen, and they were allowed to uh, say, what they, say what they really fucking thought about Actually it. Actually speak their minds. Uh, it bombed so hard. And then the Soundgarden reunion happened so soon after the end of that doomed album cycle. It is entirely plausible that Cornell did the Soundgarden reunion just to try to make everyone forget about the awful album that he made. Then they put out that other album like a couple years later, right? After they got back together yeah. and they put out the album they, that also got panned pretty hard. They announced the reunion, I think, like a year after that 
solo album Scream. Audio Slave, I don't have much to say musically. That shit was really boring. I wonder how embarrassed all the dudes from Rage were to have participated in the Like a Stone recording yeah. session. That is a wuss of a song. I remember when it came out because I remember thinking like, oh shit, these two rock bands are getting together, putting out an album. I mean, at least Velvet Revolver had like exactly what you expected, right? Yeah. Like a super group of uh, Guns N' Roses and Stone Temple Pilots and it's like gritty songs about fucking and you're like, okay, this makes sense. Better than Soundgarden, yes. better than Audio Slave. Right. Audio Slave comes out and you're thinking it's going to be like gritty and about like something that matters like i don't know slavery or something i don't know some deep <laughs> deep 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 thing that you know but that's why you listen to like rage against the machine because you're like yeah <laughs> politics and this this shit sucks like a stone comes out okay cool dude what happened to like where's the politics and where's the anger well the the first single was cochise which i got to imagine it was the rage guys being like can we at least title it something that right. people might think is a political statement right and then that's actually my favorite thing about audio slave is after they broke up obviously everyone asked you know what happened what happened cornell would always say some shit that basically that Tom Morello was too political. It's like, dude, you joined a band with Tom Morello. What did you think he was like? Yeah. He's the Neil deGrasse Tyson of politics. The dude is insufferable. Right. He can't not say something. He can't Everything not. Everything is always oh. going to come back to every injustice in the world is always going to be part of every conversation. That's what I would expect. I, I, I remember when I came out being so disappointed. That it wasn't about slavery, you said? <laughs> no, I don't know. Like, Injustice. Fuck. I thought this album was going to be about slavery. I thought they were going to sing about, I don't know, what would have been popular at the time. Like, <laughs> the Iraq war was bullshit or something. You know what I mean? I don't know. This next song is called No WMDs. That's right. Something. <laughs> and they didn't. It was none of that. This next song is called Osama Did Nothing Wrong. <laughs> All right, we're getting kicked off YouTube for that one for sure. If uh, Soundgarden is your favorite band. <laughs> your favorite band sucks. Real quick, we have a lot of fun in this podcast and tell a lot of jokes. That last thing I said was definitely a joke, if we need to specify. But it's important that if you are uh, suicidal, concerns of suicide if this is something that you deal with yeah it's important that you know that there is help you can dial 988 on your phone you can even text message 988 and get help from suicide crisis hotlines so yeah although we tell a lot of jokes and this is goofy and we tell stories suicide is something that's serious and something that should be taken serious and if that is something that you are struggling with please reach out to somebody and have a conversation and get, get some help. You are welcome for listening to another ultra mega okay installment of your favorite band sucks. You know, you got to ask yourself, is this the last episode we're ever going to do on a grunge band? I think we've done all the ones that matter. Huh. Anyway, uh, Mark dropped this bombshell in the middle of a bunch of other stuff, so some or most of you may have missed it when he pointed out how strong the Ted Nugent influence was in the music of Soundgarden. And he was correct. It is there. I've got to guess this is something Soundgarden fans extremely do not want to acknowledge. However, if you don't believe there are millions of Generation X and younger people in this world who are certain the Ted Nugent song Stranglehold is in fact by the same band that did Black Hole Sun, you are completely delusional. Spot the difference between these two pictures? There isn't one. Stranglehold sounds like a random person in Seattle at the height of the grunge epidemic hated grunge so fucking much they invented a time machine, went back 20 years, and convinced one of the most famous rock acts on the planet to do a song that sounds exactly like Soundgarden. In the hopes of returning to the 90s and finding Soundgarden no longer in existence because everyone had already heard that bullshit. 
If you as a Soundgarden fan made a playlist of your favorite Soundgarden songs and threw Stranglehold on in the middle of it, nobody would fucking notice. So there you go, Mark Mosley won, Soundgarden fans zero. Alright, if you were holding off on snagging our new t-shirt until we actually got them made, it is no longer a pre-order. We have the shirts. Repeat, we have the shirts. And... We're going to go the extra mile of including our very brand new t-shirt design in the Black Friday sale on the website. This next part is very important. The code you need to use is all caps, CREED FOREVER, with the numeral 4 in the middle. C-R-E-E-D, the numeral 4, E-V-E-R, CREED FOREVER. We'll get you 30% off at shop.yfbspod.com until Tuesday. That's right, people, a real Black Friday sale. Remember those? Don't say we never did anything nice for you. As for what's coming up next on the pod, y'all know what time it is. In fact, it's getting to the point where it's impossible to forget for even one full hour of waking life what time it is. Because that most unholy of seasons is upon us once again. Join us, won't you, as we venture once more into the wicked realm of Christmas music sucks.